gonna call this this bad boy to an order. Um, the time is six o'clock. I'd like to call this meeting to order. Um, we have a lot to cover this evening. And so we are going to get started with um, the remote electronic attendance. There you go. I would like to make a motion to approve the remote electronic attendance of second ward alderman David Parker, third ward alderman Mike Went, sixth ward alderman Kevin Schoonmaker at the Committee of the Whole and City Council meetings of April 21st, 2020. Second. We have a motion by Alderman Moyer, a second by Alderman Williams. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? That motion carries. Thank you very much, Alderman Moyer. We do have two proclamations this evening. Ginny. Thank you. The first proclamation um, is from Tony Lodi, Utilities General Manager, and is a proclamation for Drinking Water Week. Whereas water is our most valuable natural resource, and whereas any, or I'm sorry, only tap water delivers public health protection, fire protection, support for our economy, and the quality of life we enjoy, whereas any measure of a successful society low mortality rates, economic growth and diversity, productivity and public safety are in some way related to access to safe water. Whereas each resident of the city of Moline is called upon to help protect our source waters from pollution, to practice water conservation, to become involved in local water issues by learning more about this valuable resource. Now therefore, Stephanie Acri, Mayor of Moline, does proclaim May 3rd through the 9th, 2020 as Drinking Water Week. And our second proclamation is from Interim Public Works Director Rod Schick. And this is the National Public Works Week proclamation. Whereas public works professionals focus on infrastructure facilities and services that are, that are of vital importance to sustainable and resilient communities, to the public health, high quality of life, and well-being of the people of Moline. Whereas it is in the public interest for the citizens, civic leaders, and children in Moline to gain knowledge of and to maintain a progressive interest and understanding of the importance of public works and public works programs in their respective communities. Whereas the year 2020 marks the 60th annual National Public Works Week sponsored by the American Public Works Association and Canadian Public Works Association. Now therefore, Stephanie Acri, Mayor of Moline, does hereby proclaim May 17th through the 23rd, 2020 as National Public Works Week. Thank you, Denise. I appreciate, appreciate it. it. Um, are there any questions on the agenda this evening? Do you want to skip to the council first, uh, first item? Oh, yes. I'm sorry. We're going to Well, is the... anybody, does any, do any of my um, council members intend to leave after the bond hearing? Mayor, we do have a couple of people that have remoted in just for that, and then they could drop off afterwards. Oh, of course, certainly. Yes. So we're going to switch it up a little bit, and we're going to address an item that is on the council agenda. It is. So do we need to go into that meeting, Dirk? Yes. Yes, we do. We need to recess the uh, okay. whole. All right. So uh, we, we're going to move in and take care of some business that's on the regular council agenda. I'm going to recess this meeting. We're going to open up the council meeting, address that, and then we're going to go back into the committee of the whole. So I now call for a recess of the committee of the whole. I'm opening the council uh, agenda, and we're going to jump forward to council bill resolution, second reading. Where is it? Well, you know what, Mayor, if I could just I'll uh -huh. start out with okay. my normal... Uh, you're on our request approval of Committee of the Whole and Council meeting minutes of April 28th, 2020. Mm -hmm. Second reading ordinances. Council Bill 3010-2020, an ordinance authorizing the issuance of taxable general obligation refunding bonds series 2020A of the City of Moline, Illinois, and authorizing the Mayor and City Clerk to execute and attest to an agreement disclosure with Robert W. Baird and company for underwriting services related to the refinancing of the 2020A bonds. If I may. Let's back up one little bit, uh, Madam Clerk. We don't have to repeat all that stuff, but I'd like you to, uh, the mayor's called it to order. I'd like you to do the roll call to establish that we do in fact have six of the elected officials in the building today. Okay, sure. Um, Alderman Williams. Present. Parker. Present. Wentz. Present. He's present remotely. Right. Would you clarify if you're present in chambers or present remotely? Present remotely. Thank you. Alderman Wentz? Present remotely. 
Alderman Potter. Present in chambers. Alderman Moyer. Present. Schoonmaker. Present remotely. Alderman Waldron. Present. And Alderman Berg. Present in the building. So let the record reflect Waldron's in the building as well, and Alderman Moyer is also present physically in chambers. All right, now we've redone all that, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, just for total clarification, Alderman Williams is also present in chambers. <laughs> so, you know, the only um, alderman who as are, is the mayor. We need to be as the mayor will vote. Sorry, mm -hmm. and Mayor mm -hmm. Acre is present. Yes. Thank <laughs> you. Motion, motion to approve the consent agenda. Oh, I think that we're going to have some conversation about this, aren't we? So should we pull this item off of the consent agenda so that our experts can share with us information? That's a great idea. All right. Motion to approve, motion to approve 3010-2020. Can you pull it off the consent agenda, please? Because Janine already presented it on the consent agenda. Uh, I rescind my, my motion to approve the consent agenda. Okay. And make a motion to approve 3010-2020. Can you just pull it off the, you, yeah, we're gonna just pull it off the consent agenda. And then, so we'll approve the minutes first. Do I have a motion to approve the minutes with uh, so 3010 pulled off? So we have a motion to approve the minutes as read by, or as presented by Alderman mm -hmm. Moyer. We have a second by Alderman Williams. Uh, roll call, please. Alderman Schoomaker? Aye. Waldron? Aye. Berg? Aye. Williams? Aye. Parker? Aye. Went? Aye. Potter? Aye. Moyer? Aye. Eight ayes, no nays. That motion carries. I now entertain your motion, Alderman Parker, to approve 3010-2020. Motion to approve 3010-2020. Second. We have a motion by Alderman Parker and a second by Alderman Potter. Uh, for uh, approval of Council Bill General Ordinance 3010-2020 that clerk has already read. Um, is there any discussion or any information for this item? I turn towards our experts that are in, have joined us. Well, I, I don't see Carol. There's Carol. No, there's Carol and there's Anthony. She's, she's, she's there. You're muted, Carol. Hold on. She's muted on her end. Carol, you're muted on your end. We can see you talking, Carol. She's I'm, I'm Star she's six, muted. is it? Yeah, she might have to star six if she's on the phone. Are you on the phone, Carol? Because if you're on the phone, you may need a star six. Are you on the computer? Her microphone has a slash through it there. I just I'm, Oh, I'm so sorry. You okay. We got you now. Can you hear me? Yep, you can hear me now? We yes. can. I'm sorry, that's crazy. Okay. No, we're having a rough You're start. On. We're gonna we're gonna get like the swing of things here. There she is. No, we we've, we've got it we've got with the program now. So Your Honor, I am very pleased to report that we held our bond sale today to refinance our taxable general obligation corporate purpose bond series 2011A. And with the low bid, we will realize a total of five hundred and seven thousand dollars and $781.19 of total savings. So $507,781.19 of total savings with a true interest rate of 2.7864%. And our financial advisor, Anthony Maselli, is with us tonight on the screen as well. And he is going to just give a very brief review of the sale today. Great, thank you, Carol. Um, so as Carol had mentioned, we had a, a, a really great sale today. Um, this was a deal that we began at the end of last year. Um, we had this queued for a sale in March, and that was subsequently postponed due to the market disruption caused by the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. For since that time, we had been watching the market. There was very little liquidity, uh, not an opportunity to get back into the market, uh, especially given that this was refunding for savings. Uh, we were we were ready to sit on the sidelines and, and wait for that market to come back. And 
for the last two weeks, we've, we've seen some stability. Uh, it gave us promise that we were gonna be able to get back in. So we set up the sale for this morning. Uh, the underwriter, Robert W. Baird, uh, started pre-marketing this issue last Thursday. Uh, and they, they came ready to go this morning. They ran a one hour order period from 9.30 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. and solicited $26 million in, in uh, offers for your 6.25 million in bonds. So uh, a good amount of oversubscriptions. They, they had more offers than bonds, bonds to deliver. Uh, because of that, they were able to reprice the issue with lower interest rates uh, during the, the pricing period increase the projected savings. As, as Carol had mentioned, total savings is uh, just over $507,000. It averages out to about $45,000 per year over the life of the loan. Uh, the, the refinancing does not extend uh, or change the, the current amortization, or I should say the original amortization of the 2011 A bonds. Uh, it is simply a, a footprint refunding for annual savings. On a present value basis, it's over 7.5% uh, of refunded principal that, that the city saved today. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions regarding the refinancing. Do we have any questions from the alderman? Hearing none, roll call, please. Alderman Skinmaker? Aye. Baldwin? Aye. Berg? Aye. Williams? Aye. Parker? Aye. Wendt? Aye. Potter? Aye. Moyer? Aye. Mayor Aiken? Aye. Nine ayes, no nays. That motion carries. I'd now like to recess out of the council meeting and we're gonna go back into the committee of the whole. Uh, we are at questions on the agenda. Uh, thank you very much for helping us out, Anthony and Carol, on this. This is very good news. Um, are there any questions on the agenda? Um, I did want to offer one suggestion to the council. We have a, a lot to cover, and we have some additional um, items for executive session. Do we have the executive session ready? Are you prepared? Alderman Berg has that. Alderman Berg, do you have the executive session? No. No. Okay, so Better I do. Okay, good. Well, we don't need it yet, but it's coming. Um, can can we try to proceed through this? I'd like to get into executive session uh, long before eight o'clock, but no later than eight o'clock. So could we kind of target the committee of the whole through seven thirty? I think when we have our marathon meetings, we all kind of lose um, our attentiveness. So I want to make sure that we're expediting our way through that. We've got a lot to cover. Um, so, the first agenda item is the 2020 service fees, Dirk Price, Corporation Council. This, uh, thank you, Mayor. This follows up uh, on the last meeting um, where Alderman Waldron uh, suggested bringing back a revision to the prior resolution that was forgiving fees, uh, late fees, and also uh, ending the disconnection. This, um, we put in front of you an amendment to that resolution that would allow for the possibility of a shutoff once again, unless the person got into some sort of minimal repayment plan. Uh, one note for this, our software on billing and shutoffs and all the rest, and how it talks to public works about what needs to happen is binary. It's sort of on, off. And so there'll be some growing pains implementing this if you um, pass it. We just want to make sure you're clear with that, that in getting the payment plan established and who's being shut off and who's not, or maybe a little bit of payment plan. But this uh, was presented in, at the request of Alderman Waldron from the, the last meeting. Motion to approve. Motion to approve. Uh, second. We have a motion to approve by Alderman Moyer. If you're uh, making a motion remotely, could you please shout out your name for me? Because it's a little hard for me to tell who's talking. Was that, was that Alderman Parker? So Alderman, Alderman Waldron second. Thank you. Alderman Waldron second. Is there any discussion on this item? Um, I have a question. So are we gonna put some, some additional step in place before a turn off is executed? Is a provision to protect us from? I'll talk with staff. We were, um, yeah, we're concerned about, uh, we'll have a 
we'll have a period of time since we uh, made that action on the 24th mm -hmm. till like this goes into effect where uh, folks um, were given the abeyance, you know, without any payment plan and we don't have any. So yeah, we're gonna kind of try and package them up separately so they don't get um, notices because they're not in a payment plan because we have to turn, we'll have to turn our notification back on. Well, and as a pragmatic matter, um, Mayor, apart from codifying it, we've got some new procedures in place in Public Works about how we relate with people who don't necessarily be online or get an email. So to leave a notice on the door that they're facing disconnection without a payment plan, that's going to take more time than normal because it's gonna be, we're not gonna have a personal interaction, so it's gonna be transmitted with a piece of paper through an envelope left on the door and give them some time. So as a practical matter, we're gonna to have to build some time into how the, before there's a shut off and giving people an opportunity to come in and pay. So we'll just have to work that out in procedures to make sure there is time for that to happen, recognizing the inability to um, communicate with some of these folks by other means. I'd, I'd like to have a formal procedure in place that accommodates all of that and is documented so that if something goes wrong, we can understand what went wrong and how to make a correction. If it's not clearly defined what's supposed to happen and what our plan is, I think that it leaves more risk of us um, making a mistake. Okay, so JD, we can uh, let's you and I work on that, and we'll have it in the packet for the first reading next week. I'd appreciate that. Thank you, Alderman Potter. And I, and I'm hoping that our 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 intent here is just to get some measure of compliance, not not to become heavy-handed about this because. This is widespread in terms of economic impact by around the community and to our, our citizens. That's our, our goal is simply to get yeah. some sort of, you know, compliance and or uh, dialogue. Yeah. Uh, my, my only fear is just like what he said, we have, have 17,800 accounts in there and uh, it's just a switch on or off. And so I'm, I'm just worried about some slipping through the cracks and, and um, you know, getting that notification and us having to circle back and kind of correct a customer service issue. Thank you. All right, that's it. Uh, all those in favor, or I'm sorry, yeah, all those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? That motion carries. The next item is the Coronavirus Emergency Supplemental Funding Grant, Chief Galt. Thank you, Your Honor. Good evening, Council. Uh, I'd like your permission to apply for some free money. Uh, the Bureau of Justice <laughs> <Assist> <laughs> the Bureau of Justice Assistance announced a coronavirus emergency supplemental funding program for law enforcement uh, based on the Burn JAG grant eligibility criteria. And if you remember, a few months ago, I came before you. Uh, and we uh, approved uh, applying for the burn grant. So we're already in that system uh, and communities eligible for a local direct award are based off of that JAG grant criteria and they've already uh, in the announcement said that the city of Moline is available for up to $48,027 in grant funds. So I'm asking for your approval tonight to submit a uh, grant application uh, for the burn uh, grant uh, coronavirus emergency supplemental funding program grant. Alderman Schoonmaker moved to approve. Second. We have a motion by Alderman Schoonmaker, a second by Alderman Potter. Is there any discussion on this item? And I should have uh, mentioned that uh, the deadline for application is uh, May 29th, so I was asking for it to advance to tonight's uh, council meeting as well. Is it on the agenda? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Um, any further discussion? All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 <coughs> those opposed? That motion carries. Thank you, Chief. The next item is the AT&T Sixth Amendment to Site License Agreement. Chris Mathias. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, can everybody hear me? We yes. Can. Thank you. Okay. So this, uh, this is, like you said, the Sixth Amendment to our lease. Uh, it says new singular wireless PCS LLC on here. That's AT&T. It's our AT&T lease at the 1531 17th Avenue Watertown. Um, I had the Fifth Amendment here uh, about six months ago. And as you recall, when, when they need to change out equipment on this, whatever reason with this particular lease, whenever they need to change out equipment, we can push for another amendment of the lease. In this case, we've uh, negotiated another $300 uh, increase in the rent a month. Um, 
So, um, and as you can see on here, 30% of that will go to uh, Think Management. That's a company that has been getting 30% of the revenues on some of these things for like 20 years. We're working with our um, with corporate counsel to kind of remove them from new leases as they come about. Unfortunately for this one, we can't can't remove them, but uh, we will get the $300 additional a month and we would ask for your approval of this lease amendment. Motion to approve. Sorry. We, have, we have a motion by Alderman Moyer and a second by Alderman Potter. Is there any discussion on this item? All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? That motion carries. The next, thank you very much, Chris. Thank the, you. The next item is item number four, eliminate credit card processing fees, request for quote. Keith for Becky. We can't hear you, Keith. I think you're on mute. Oh, it. no, we're good. we're good. You're good. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you now. Sorry. Paul, a couple of months ago, there was discussion on saving over 100000 per year in credit card processing fees by passing the fee to our cardholder <clears> customer. <throat> the majority of the credit card fees are currently being absorbed by the four utility funds. Um, in your council packet tonight is a quote comparison from the two preferred vendors of our software company. Um, the goals of the solicitation was to first solicit preferred vendors of our software company um, to pass all processing fees to our cardholder customers um, to have real-time integration with our software company, our software. Um, to have a seamless interaction with our QR utility accounts for our customers, and to continue uh, PCI compliance, which uh, our current software vendor has had problems with being PCI compliant um, with their data. And the last thing is a bonus, because we are passing the fees to our customers, we're able to add a IVR system, with it, which is an interactive voice response system, which will be available 24-7 to our utility customers, and actually any customer of the city that needs to pay a city bill. Um, the good news, uh, the latest solicitation that we um, received, as you can see from the um, comparison, company A, actually the fee had dropped from dropped to 395 per um, payment from the 495 that we originally received two years ago in 2018. So if you take a look at the um, quote comparison, so a utility customer, if they pay a utility bill up to $650, their convenience fee will be $3.95 for that transaction. Now, some may say, well, they, they might have to pay more than $650. Uh, unfortunately, what they'll have to do, uh, they'll have to say the bill is $800. they will pay one at $650, $395, and then the next payment at $150, and there'll be another charge of $395. For all non-utility payments, uh, the fee structure is a, just a flat percentage and it's 2.45% up to a maximum payment of $1,000. And then the same scenario, if they need to pay higher than 1,000, they would have to submit two payments, but they can do that on the same screen. Um, so our recommendation uh, to go with company A, which is Paymentus Corp Corporation. They're the most responsive and, and um, responsible bidder to this solicitation. Any questions? Motion to approve. We have a motion by Alderman Moyer. Second, Schoonmaker. We have a second by Alderman Schoonmaker. Is there any discussion on this item? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Alderman Schoonmaker. Keith, it appears that Company A will allow an ACH to be done through this process for no charge, is that correct? Uh, the way, no, the way it has to work, uh, my understanding through them is when you solicit a, uh, say, a Visa customer, 
I uh, actually it's visa rule. Uh, the, they're going to be paying the three dollars and ninety five cents even for the e check ACH. Um, what that line shows is the other company um, charges an additional dollar ninety five per transaction. So, uh, uh, yeah, okay. that that line probably should have said three ninety five plus zero versus five fifty plus one dollar and ninety five cents per transaction. So the yep, fee is going to be now. the same. Okay. Yep. Any other questions? All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? That motion carries. Thank you very much, Keith, for your research on that. That is very helpful. Thank you. Uh, the next item is the Floresciente Streetscape Phase 2, K.J. Whitley and Jeff Anderson. K.J., are you talking? Because we can't hear you. You're muted. KJ, would you, can you unmute yourself? Hey. Is she doing it through the computer, Don, or I phone? Got her. You got her. KJ, can you say something just so we can hear you? Good evening, Mayor, can you hear me? We can hear you. All right, well, good evening, everyone. Thank you. I'm back before you guys to ask for permission to move forward with completing phase one of the Floresente Streetscape and a reduced phase of the phase two Floresente Streetscape. I'm also asking for consideration so the contractor can get moving on the project. Uh, we estimate it to be about $125,000, and those funds are available in our CDBG. Motion to approve. Second. We have a motion by Alderman Moyer, a second by Alderman Potter. Is there any discussion on this item? Hearing no discussion, all those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? That motion carries. Uh, KJ, you're up next with the updated CDBG policy and procedures manual with Appendix J. Thank you again, Mayor. On um, this one, uh, the only changes to the manual is to add the temporary language to include the governor's order where we can have our CAC-UP meetings remotely and then to include the HUD guidance where it reduces down our citizen participation plan from a 30-day comment period to a five-day comment period during the term of the mayor's, not the mayor, excuse me, of the governor's order. Motion to approve. Second. We have a motion by Alderman Potter, a second by Alderman Williams. Is there any discussion on this item? All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? That motion carries. I do not believe we have any others this evening. Is that correct? We do have another. Oh, Dirk's, Dirk's coming up to the podium. Uh, one other, which is I wanted to alert the council, uh, by law, uh, we are required to have current lists of um, prospective candidates for both police and fire. The police one expires tomorrow, and the uh, fire, if I've got it right, in July. Um, and we're required by law to have those lists. Um, and so we're going to move forward with doing the testing necessary to have the lists that we're required to have. It'll be one less problem we have going forward. Um, but we just wanted to be clear and report to you that that doesn't mean we're hiring anybody as part of the overall discussion. It's just a housekeeping matter that we're required by law to do. We wanted to make that clear that that's going to happen. Okay. Any questions for Dirk? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, when we were going over the questions on the agenda, I did forgot to I forgot to mention that we we're going to um, go into our, our um, COVID nineteen budgetary discussions. We're going to have that be a routine agenda item in our committee of the whole moving forward. Everybody, we just did get it on this agenda, so that'll be our last informational tonight. So we're going to begin with our informationals, and KJ, you'll be launching that CDBG COVID nineteen proposed activities. Oh, and Jeff Anderson. Hey. Thank you again, Mayor. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Somehow my cameras are messing up on my end, so hopefully you can hear me and see me. I apologize for that. Um, 
Don, are you running the slides? I can't see the slides on my end. So does he have the first slide up there? I'm yes. sorry. Can you see okay. it now, KJ? Okay, now I can see it, now I can see it. Okay, Don, can you advance to the next slide, please? Thank you. So in the first round, uh, the city of Moline, since we're in entitlement for CDBG, we were awarded $478,057. Uh, the guidance on what that can be used for is very limited. Um, I know we've been in contact with HUD through email, through phone calls. Um, little by little, they're letting out information. But then finally, we had a meeting with our colleagues uh, with uh, Rock Island and Davenport, and we learned what they were doing with their dollars. And basically, right now, everyone's interpretation is if it's an eligible activity under the normal CDBG, it can be eligible under the CDBG COVID-19. So with that moving forward, we do not know if there's gonna be another round because they call this one the first round. So we're not sure if there's gonna be another round for the entitlements. Uh, we don't know how it's gonna impact our timeliness. And our timeliness again is uh, one and a half times our annual allocation on October 30th of every year. Uh, for those dollars that we have not spent, if we're over, uh, they're subject to being recaptured by HUD. Uh, we don't know how long we have to use this money since it's special money, if you will. It's not our annual money that we receive from them. Uh, <clears throat> and at any time, if you guys have any questions, please jump in. I'm sorry. Um, we don't know if uh, we established a program and we have money come back to us, is that considered program income? Then if it is considered program income, do we have to use it on another COVID-19 related activity or can we use it on a non-COVID activity? Um, so we're kind of moving forward. Hopefully those questions are gonna be answered by the time the plan makes its way to HUD. Don, can I have the next slide, please? So with that being said, uh, we sat down and uh, uh, we discussed what's gonna have an economic impact to our community. Um, we know that our businesses are hurting. Um, we know that uh, renters, especially renters, probably since uh, COVID-19 has hit in the last two weeks, I've probably had 35 requests for rental assistance and utility assistance from uh, renters in Moline. Uh, so when we sat down and we were trying to put proposed programs together for you guys, we thought that the small, small business loan would be a great one. Uh, we're proposing a $10,000 loan with a one year forgivable, as a one year forgivable loan for 19 businesses in Moline. Um, you know, a lot of businesses are kind of reluctant to accept additional money because it adds to their debt load. And we felt by doing a forgivable loan, that's not gonna add to their debt load. Um, we're just trying to keep them afloat. As far as the rental assistance program, I've been in conversations with uh, Salvation Army, who currently runs our program for us. Uh, they said that there's a great need. And as I said earlier, I've had so many phone calls for people looking for rental assistance with rent anywhere from $50 a month to over $1,000 a month. Um, they just have not paid the April rent, have not been in a position to do that because of their change in revenue. Um, a third program that we would like to propose to you guys is uh, education awareness. Um, unfortunately, COVID-19 is gonna be here for a, lot of time, a long time, and we want people to be aware of it, what they need to do, how they need to do it. And we just want to keep getting that message out there, not only in English, but in several languages. Um, so I've been in communication with Rock Island County Health Department, as well as the CHC. Uh, Rock Island County Health Department is more than excited to do that for us, to continue to run that campaign and give them $10,000 to do that. And then the last one is the administration to run these programs, the business loan program, and oversee the grant can I have the next slide, please? So moving forward, um, having the preliminary approval from you guys on the proposed programs, after that, we'll prepare 
our substantial amendment to the annual action plan. We'll get our citizens involved and hear their feedback. And then we'll bring all that back to you guys for final approval. Once we receive your final approval, we'll send that up to HUD for HUD's approval. Uh, once we see uh, receive HUD's approval and get the grant agreement, as well as complete the environmentals, and then get a policy in place in our procedure manual again on how we will do the business loans, uh, that'll come back to you guys too. So at this time, I would open it up to any questions. Can you switch back to their faces? Mm -hmm. I can't see your faces. So if you, oh, there's Alderman Wynn. Um, I had a quick question regarding the uh, the business, the ten thousand uh, dollar forgivable. Um, does that have any conditions on it? I, I'm, you know, I, I've been in favor of us uh, doing infusions to, to make sure that our businesses stick around. Um, but I'd also like if if we're giving them ten thousand dollars forgivable, that there's some conditions to get that forgiven. I, I, I hate to have a situation in which we give somebody ten thousand dollars and then they uh, never open up or they close down, you know, a month after things open up or they move to another city or, or something like that. Um, I'd like to have some kind of, uh, um, you know, if they're going to be getting this, if it is forgivable, that uh, some requirement that they, they stay and continue to operate and, and be in Moli. That's a very good point. And and on that, when, I, when I'm proposing this program to you guys, uh, it has to be a pre-existing business that's still in business currently. Uh, but yeah, we can certainly write those provisions into the program. Uh, luckily for us, it's our program, so we can kind of, you know, write it the way that we want to write it. Um, so we will keep that in mind as we're putting together a proposal to bring back to you guys. Alderman Schoomaker. KJ, have you had any conversations with Jeff Manis along the road about this? Yes, uh, matter of fact, uh, we did a conference call today, uh, myself, Jeff, and Tara, and we're gonna do a follow-up one after council tonight, well, not tonight, but tomorrow morning. Okay. Uh, to follow I, I up would just, it. thanks, I'm glad you did, and I would encourage you to keep him in the loop because he you know, he worked with Alderman Parker on, on the, the other business loans, so he's got a feel for what the need is and and you know he may have some input on uh what those restrictions that alderman went are talking about should be or could be so that'd be great oh i, I agree i agree um we know that he was very active on that round i think he might even be on the call tonight i don't know if he's on the listen in call or the audio call, call where he can uh, comment on it for you but yes he's very much involved in it good so while we're talking about the the forgivable loans, the the size of the loans is concerning to me, and the forgivable component is concerning to me. I mean, I, I want to be able to support these businesses, um, and I want to be able to support them through this. And I don't think we're through it. I don't think it's a it's a one time deal. I think that we're still going to have problems a year out. We're still going to have problems two years out. And to burn through the money um, so quickly with grants is concerning to me. So I've got I've got some issues with that structure. And then there were a couple other things. Um, I have been in communications as directed by council to uh, strengthen our relationships with the school district. One of the things that they're struggling with is they have a certain percentage of their students that do not have access to um, the internet. And so they've gone through the process of providing um, some hotspots to some of their students, but they don't have the funding to provide uh, hotspots or internet access to all of the students that require it. I would like to see us partner with the school to look at what we can do to support that endeavor, as well as support our low income families, because there is a direct statistically significant correlation between um, people in poverty and their likelihood to contract COVID-19. And there's multiple reasons why, but one of them is that they don't have internet access, which a lot of us take for granted. So by not having internet access, they have to get on a bus and go pay their bill. 
they have to um, go to a business to apply for a job. If they're lucky enough that they accept paper applications, a lot of businesses only accept applications online. Um, if they need to go use online services, unfortunately the library is closed right now, but when the library is open, they take a bus over to, to access those services. So it's much more difficult for people in poverty that do not have internet access to do simple things like apply for unemployment. And so I'd like for us to step back and look at what our options are and be creative instead of just rolling out programs that we've had in place that may be duplicated by other entities. Like I just talked to our new executive director of Project Now and they just got $300,000 for rent subsidy. So there's other programs that we may be um, overlapping that we may be better off to work to complement instead. Um, in talking to Project Now, they also said that um, their, one of their concerns is our, our adolescents that are living in poverty and what happens to them as we move forward. There will be um, very little job opportunity for them, so it may be a good investment of our resources to come alongside the school again and partner with an entity like Project Now to offer some job training, to offer some internships, to offer some subsidized employment to keep our youth um, busy and healthy and doing things they should be doing instead of things they shouldn't be doing. So KJ, um, would it be possible for us to kind of slow roll this to make sure that we understand all the opportunities and we understand all of the partnerships or is there a sense of urgency that you've got because of something I don't understand? Oh no, Mayor, we, we can take, we definitely can take a step back. Um, allow me to reach out to Project Now and kind of understand a little bit more about their program because the way that I understood it in the past, that $300,000 would be community-wide, uh, not just uh, Rock Island or not just Moline, but three counties would share in that pot of money. So let me obtain a better understanding of that program. And certainly we can look into the hot spots for the children and possibly a couple other programs based on what you said and come back to you guys. If not the next meeting, um, if not the next meeting, uh, possibly the meeting thereafter, if that's okay. Yeah, I think that something else that is concerning to me is the administrative costs. I would much rather have us use that funding and partnership with somebody that wouldn't have that same administrative um, expense. So an organization like Project Now, they already have wraparound services for their um, Head Start families, and, and that gets us past a lot of that administrative cost to get it into the hands of the residents. So I, that would be important to me as well, but I, I'm a, I'm open to other comment from the council if anybody else has any ideas or concerns or timeline. Alderman Potter. Um, with, with regard to the business loans, uh, I'm wondering if there m might be a way to parse, parse that out a little bit broader too. I mean, maybe may not every business needs a full $10,000. I mean, I'm just speculating, I have no idea might be more okay. ability to handle some other businesses. Maybe there's some home businesses, those sorts of things that are struggling. And Okay, we can certainly take a look at that. Does anybody else have any feedback for KJ before we set her off again on her mission? This is Alderman, Alderman Parker. Parker. Hi, Alderman Parker. Go ahead. I, I, first of all, I can't see anything on the screen. Um, I don't know if everybody else is having that problem it too. but. Great. Uh, mine's gray. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, secondly, um, sure? again, I, I don't know if we can put re these restrictions on it, but if we do do the, if we move forward with the business loans, I would like to exclude class, class K um, liquor license establishments. I'm sorry, Alderman Parker, I missed what you were saying. Oh, you want to restrict it? I would like to okay, yeah, yeah. restrict them from being eligible for this uh, grant, potential grant. Okay. I got that noted, Alderman Parker. What's the council's feel? I mean, I just am not bought into the idea of a grant. That feels uncomfortable to me unless there are <laughs> some some quite extensive carrot that would make that make sense to have that money just go away. Is the rest of the council good with it? Because maybe I'm just being conservative needlessly. 
Nothing. All right. Mayor? Yes, uh, Alderman Wynn. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, the way that uh, KJ uh, represented, I, I, I didn't know if that was a requirement of this because there was some discussion of if the money came back, then would that put us over the limit and some money would get uh, uh, pulled out of our account because we had too much? Um, I, I, I'd like to better understand that because um, uh, if, you know, if, if, if it has to be paid back, then we've got this revenue source of, of more money coming in. And if we can do it kind of like a revolving loan fund, that's terrific. But um, I, I, I guess maybe I misunderstood from, uh, from the description that that may wind up causing other issues with some of our other funds or that HUD may take it back. Mayor, if I may? Yes, please. Um, as far as the loans, we can do those as the way that I understand it, and please correct me if I'm wrong, Jeff and Tara, who are also on the call. We can do that either as a grant or we can do it as a, a loan that they would have to pay back with low interest or a forgivable loan. Um, we're just, we were looking at the economic impact on our businesses. And earlier in my presentation, Alderman went, what I was talking about possibly having issues with the timeliness. I was explaining that HUD has not told us how it's gonna affect our timeliness, because technically we cannot have more than one and a half of our allocation in the bank that has not been spent. Otherwise, it's subject to recapture by HUD uh, for not being timely. But they don't really, they have not really provided us guidance. That's just one of those unknown questions that we have right now. Um, you know, we can write the program as we want to write the program. What's in the best interest of our community, that's how we're proposing to move forward. So whatever direction that you guys want us to put into that program, we can certainly do that. It's our program to write, but I think it's an important program to have for our businesses. Your Honor, Alderman Waldron. Hi. Go ahead. Uh, I have a concern about I have a concern about the amount of the administrative fees. I would like to see that lowered. And I'm not a huge fan, like Alderman Wentz said, of the just giving away the ten thousand dollars. But I also think that the idea of the hot spots is excellent. We'll, we'll, Your Honor. we'll continue that conversation. Um, so the preliminary conversation was just with the uh, superintendent and the CFO. And so our staff would need to join up. We need to talk to the board about how we could partner better with them. But we want to, I think that there's an opportunity for families, even without students, to uh, benefit in this, this stressful time. Alderman Potter. Have the, uh, uh, the superintendent uh, Moline schools, if you've had conversations, have they had conversations with uh, some of the school districts on the other side of the river? Because I know, for instance, I think I heard somewhere where Davenport has provided over 100 hotspots. I, I, don't, I don't think they're providing them into families or whatever, but they're providing them into certain areas where they're more accessible for, for folks. I'm just wondering if they're, uh, I'm, Although I want to be helpful, I'm wondering why the Moline School District isn't doing more in this area. So when in our conversation, they're, they're being quite proactive. Uh, this is all something new, but I think that um, they think that it's a reasonable thing to expect of this situation not resolving. So there may, moving forward, always be a need for some type of remote connectivity. And I can't remember the, what was the phrase that they used to, to tell us? The issue is called digital equity, digital. so that uh, people right. have equal sources to it. Uh, there are a couple of models. The one you're talking about where we erect uh, mobile antennas, the kind of things we do in a disaster when it's a tornado or a flood. Um, the problem with those is they're not as uh, useful and convenient, and they don't work as well, and they're much more expensive to have Verizon or anybody else put up one of those. What the school district's done is they've maximized every grant dollar they can to do this. So uh, our school district, the Moline School District. So they've gotten two grants and they've used all of that money to put the hotspot, looks like uh, 
for them with the Chromebook that comes through a federal grant to help impoverish students, that gives them the Chromebooks for school use. And then the hotspot with that is a thumb drive that goes into that. That's a little bit more expensive and they got a secondary grant to help with those and they've spent all the money on that. And those thumb drives are expensive. What the, the mayor has encouraged uh, me to look at and she's looked at, we've done some research. Uh, the hockey puck, looks like a hockey puck, the hotspot, right. those are cheaper. Now they, you know, you can't run movies and you can't do that, but you can pay a bill, you can submit your resume, you can do some other things with that, uh, you know, and you can connect uh, like four or five devices for a very modest amount of money. So we're trying, and there's a state of Illinois uh, competitive bid for the monthly subscription. So for a relatively modest amount of the grant money, you can put that in the hands of maybe 400 people 400 families so that they can A, do e-learning and B, get their jobs and get their bills paid. So that's that's where we're focused to try and make this digital equity work that way. But the school district, they, they have maximized every grant they've got and part of what they're up against is the federal funding that comes to them under the CARES Act, they're not allowed to pre-spend. So they're paralyzed at the moment until the grant funds are in hand. They have to make a proposal and do it. So our partnership might be a way to get them over the hump and then we figure out how they pay us back or they, they uh, or how they, they then buy the next round. They assume the financial responsibilities right. at the point they are financially right. The subscriptions able to. or whatever. So the monthly subscription costs. So that's the kind of high level conversation the mayor had and I was listening to today. So. That, that answers some of your questions? There, there may be an opportunity for just standard internet service as well. So we've got some community partners there. We've got Geneseo Fiber, Mediacom, and then we've got Metronet coming in. And we'll be working with them because that may be the best low cost solution as well. But it just, there's a lot of moving parts. I just wanted to see if the council was open to it. And, and while we're heading down that road, can we get some sort of numbers attached to all of that? Just, yep. just so I can, thank you. Your Honor, this is Alderman Parker. Alderman Parker. Yeah, so, um, and I, I think I've missed a piece of this or somehow, I, I don't know. Is this for ongoing or just through the end of this school year? Because we're getting almost near the end of the school year. Um, with the with the governor's uh, program, he's got a phase program that he released. I sent it out as soon as I got it. Right, so, yeah. Um, it is reasonable to expect um, there to still be issues in the fall. And so it's just it's just a, a bridging thing. Um, but we will have an ongoing issue for our families that are living in poverty beyond that, because there will be Is, issues and other things. Alderman Parker. And that's good. The, thank you for that information. Um, also, uh, you know, just watching TV, and I, I don't have firsthand knowledge, maybe other people do. But it seems as though um, immediate need is for things like food banks. Also, is there a possibility this money could go towards that? We can certainly look into that, Alderman Potter. I mean, excuse me, Parker. Just one of the things that we have to be concerned with and watchful. If we give a donation to a food bank, we have to make sure that that's going to a low to moderate income individual, versus just giving a donation. You know, here's a thousand dollars. Go buy some food. You know, we don't know if all those people are meeting the income guidelines that are receiving the food at the food bank. Uh, but we can certainly look into a way to maybe incorporate that into these dollars. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I just assume that people go. I, I don't. Know. It's new to me, so I don't understand exactly how that works. But I assume that um, hopefully people that go to the uh, the um, uh, food banks are, are ones that are truly in need. Is there anything else you want to share with us, KJ? No, you guys have given me uh, some great suggestions, and uh, we're going to, as a staff, we're going to look into those, and I've been asked to come back, not the next meeting, but the meeting thereafter. Uh, that way we'll have time to uh, facilitate it and speak with the people who we need to speak with and uh, come up with the best proposal for you guys and uh, hopefully have all the answers to your questions. Uh, one thing on the, uh, on the uh, I don't want to say hockey pucks, but on the hot spots, um, again, we have to make sure that those are going to a low to moderate income family. So there would be a application of intake to prove their income. 
um, as long as it's an eligible item in the matrix code, what it seems like, which seems like it is, but you know, just have to double check that. Uh, when it comes to, we call that low moderate clientele. Yeah. So the eligibility for those programs is based on the uh, on the household income. So, but we'll take a look at all these things from the food bank to the hockey, hockey, uh, the hot spots to uh, partnering with the school district, partnering with Project Now, uh, continuing again to partner with Salvation Army. Uh, coming up with the best use of the money for the businesses as well as the individuals and families in the communities. Thank you so much, KJ, I appreciate it. Thank you guys. The next item on the informational is the sole source professional services agreement with Scheid Hattery Inc. for re-roofing the Moline Public Library. Sarah Mark, are you on the call? I am, thank you, Your Honor, and good evening, everyone. Can you hear me okay? We can, thank you. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to share some information on where we are at in the process for getting the roof replaced at the library. Typically something like this would have been conveyed in an email, but I do recall it being brought up at a recent meeting and I wanted to be available if there were any questions. Um, at this time, we are planning to move forward with utilizing a sole source professional service agreement to obtain engineering services from Shive Hattery, um, where they would develop and design specifications for a new roof conduct the pre-bid meeting with interested bidders. They would review the bids to ensure compliance and perform construction inspections during and at the conclusion of the project. This process was used with the municipal services re-roofing project in 2018, and it came in several hundred thousand dollars under budget. So we have a high level of confidence in their design, um, as well as their estimating cost on the, um, the end construction cost for the whole project. Um, we've had a really great relationship with them and they've done several successful projects. Um, so if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them at this time. Your Honor. Yes, Alderman Schoonmaker. Can I get a little explanation? You, you, you're saying it came in several hundred thousand under expect, expected budget, but was several hundred thousand under the budget they set? Is that like is that what they you gave mean, us, or? Sure, so we had an idea of what we were looking at to replace the roof when we did the municipal services building. Um, and so we were looking at uh, possibly spending about 1.4 million on the roof um, based off of the previous inspections that were done. And the, um, I think that they factored in some kind of a, an increase, um, you know, just over the years. And when Shive came in, they kind of gave us an idea of what we might be looking at for the construction costs. And so they were right about on par with the bids that we received. So we feel comfortable with where their uh, cost estimating is when they, when they come in and they develop the specifications for us. I'm, I'm just a little confused to why, you know, why do we, so that, you know, we can, we can have our engineering department tell us that, hey, a road's gonna cost Three hundred thousand dollars, and and miraculously it comes in at two hundred and fifty thousand. We save fifty thousand dollars. It's just a, it's just an estimate, and and of course it's on their side to be a little high on the estimate sure. and have things come in better. How much are we paying them? And I, I know this is a sole source, so we don't know that, but um, I I just have a really hard time understanding why we need an engineer to guide us through a new roof. It's, it's got a roof, we're gonna take the old roof off, we're gonna put a new roof on. What, what are we gonna pay an engineering service to do? I mean, we, we can look at three or four bids and we can compare and say, gosh, this is the same material, that's the same material, and, and these bids are, are a little less. Sure. Um so what we used them for when we redid the roof at Public Works was they came in and they evaluated the condition of the roof. They were also able to um, help us because they knew that at some point we might consider doing some sustainability efforts with the solar arrays on the roof. So they were able to identify whether or not the roof was structurally sound. Um, and they're also experts on developing the specifications for the load on the roof and what the wind speed um, can top out at and what kind of materials are going to be best used to 
make sure that it's insulated properly. So we use them because of their expertise in that specific area. Um, whereas it, but, we would love to use uh, it in-house, but they're on. I, sure, go ahead. I don't mean to be argumentative, but we Are know we, we know what the typical wind speeds are here. We, you know, if somebody's offering to put a roof on that's that's not going to be, it's not going to hold up for the duration. I mean, we, we have all kinds of roofers that are professionals. How much do we think we're going to pay them for this information that seems to be pretty um, obvious? That, you know, it just I, I just can't imagine why we're paying extra money. Um, I, I, I'm really struggling here. Why? How much do we think we're going to pay an engineer to help us decide what what roof to put on this building? Dirk has approached the podium. Uh, good evening, Alderman <laughs> Schoonmaker. So, uh, I got into municipal law through the construction side of it on roofing cases, leaking school roofing cases, uh, one after another, and collected against the designer of these. Roofing is not as uh, common sense as you think. It's a roofing system. And so you have to identify the structural components and then you have to match the system to the structural components. And that's the set of specifications that comes from the engineer. So if you were to go out to roofing contractors and say, how much to re-roof the library? You're not going to get apples to apples. You're gonna get five different fruits offered to you. And now you're gonna say, well, they all say that they're tasty. They all meet the wind load. Which one's the best one? Which is the most economical? You're gonna take the cheapest one. And then I guarantee you, even, even with Shive Hattery, you're going to have an unknown condition you're gonna find in a re-roof. And then it's gonna be a battle of you should have known or you shouldn't have known. And what I like about Shive Hattery, because I've worked with them other places, is they're good about shifting the cost to the contractor that bids on the work. So there is a technical level of expertise required to divine a, a roofing system for our particular building that isn't just available to go out to everybody who does a roof and say, what would your bid price be? So that's what the engineer brings to this process. It's, it's not so much the blueprints in this case, it's the specifications for the materials and how they relate as a system one to another and then to our building. So you're telling me to shut up? No, not at all. I'm saying, <laughs> I'm saying though that this is one of those places where, because uh, I, I frequently get this question, particularly, it's just common sense. Why can't I just hire a roofer? Well, because it's not like your house. It, a roofing system with, uh, for these kinds of buildings is very different. And I would love to just go get a competitive bid uh, and save you the money. But um, Sarah's right about Shive Hattery. He's got an excellent reputation in this particular area, re-roofs. And re-roofs have uh, you know, helped my career because they get them wrong. So um, <laughs> that's the issue. Um, I, I'd like to offer up, though, all Alderman Schoonmaker, when we um, when we first put this facilities management plan together, you know, we anticipated that roof on the library would get us through till 2026, and then uh, shortly after that, I, I found out through through part of this plan and kind of trying to adjust my estimates that they quit constructing that type of roof a year after the library was built, and so when we did the public works building, Sarah and I had some different conversations about the fact that Shive Hattery brought some new technology to us that. Uh, isn't like these rubber membranes with the aggregate on top, you know, and it does give us some flexibility for sustainability in the future because it takes off all that added weight from that aggregate and all those different technologies that they used to use 20 years ago. And so I, I guess I thought Shy was an excellent partner in that and bringing us some innovative ideas to, to help us spark some sustainability stuff in the future. And we, um, I, I guess we were encouraged to, that they would be willing to partner with us on this library roof since it's, its end of life has come much quicker than we originally thought. Alderman Parker. I think you're unmuted, Alderman Parker. I thought I had unmuted myself, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I, uh, are we working with the library's uh, facilities uh, uh, crew? You know, the, there's a, uh, a part of the board member, some of the board members are part of a board of directors for facilities. Are we working with them at all? Or are we just gonna give them a roof and say, here you go? 
I would be happy to work with the board. I, I, to be honest with you, I wasn't aware that there was a facilities board, but I would be more than happy to work with them. Um, currently, I just have a copy of the blueprint sitting on my desk, and I've been working really closely with Sue and both with Brian and um, our staff internally to try and get this um, figured out so that we don't have any more issues with active water leaks. Brian, are you on the call? He is. I think he's muted. Okay. I think maybe Brian could help determine who that is. I think it's Scott Bull is on there. Brian, maybe you're a few team. others. Hi. Yes, I'm, I'm on the call. Um, he, uh, he, Alderman Parker is correct. The library does have a building and grounds committee. Um, that they um, are by no means roof experts. Um, <laughs> so I'm sure that they would defer to the city on some kind of project as big as this. Okay, well, I'm more than happy to share any information that I have with them, um, and I'd be happy to get that information for their contact, um, if you could email it to me, so that I can make sure that they're in the loop so they know what's going on. Absolutely. Sarah, do you need- Thank you. Do you need from anything from the council this evening, Sarah? No, Your Honor, I just wanted to bring this to your attention just because of the unprecedented times. I didn't want to enter into something without making sure that you guys were aware. Well, thank you very much for that courtesy. But I, yeah, we definitely want to keep maintaining our, our buildings. We understand that there's a facilities fund and this is an appropriate use of it. So thank okay, you so great. much, Sarah. Thank um, you very much. Okay, so the time is a little bit after seven. And so it'd be awesome if we could target 7.30, but we want to every week get an update on where we are with our budget, what we now know that we didn't know, and uh, as our revenue um, projections solidify, we're wanting to keep up to date with that. So J.D. Shelty and Carol Barnes will be presenting this evening. Carol sent us an updated spreadsheet um, in via email, but I, what time was that, Carol? I've gotten so many emails, I can't find it in my email bin. Just, it, was, it was a little bit before lunchtime, if I recall. Just, yeah, about 11.50. 11.53? No? And and Don also has it on his slides. Okay. Well, it's just it hard to read it on the computer. But um, so are we going to look at the major revenue actuals by month or? Yeah. Yeah. Um, or do you? Yeah, JD. I don't know if you wanted to say a few words, or we can start on that on the revenue sheet. So, um, so yeah. So I think. During, um, yeah, Carol and I, when we met with you last week. Yeah. When we met with you last week, I think we got some really good feedback from the council members and a, a lot of interest in the um, in the projection sheet. So we were uh, thankful that Keith had time to work on it. I think he made some adjustments and changes to this that were requests of the uh, elected officials when we had our meeting. So I, I think he wants to talk through that a little bit and uh, kind of take a look at that mm -hmm. and then get your, get your feedback if we hit the targets on what you were expecting to see this look like. And, and Don, if you can bring those two attachments up on the screen. Can you see the one that's got the pink and the blue and the green and the peach? It's kind of yellowy. Yes, I, we can't see it on our screen, but do you guys have it in front of you? It's just gray pixel online. Oh, uh, I, I don't know. Don's, Don's working on it. Okay, well, I think I might just start um, as JD, there we go. As JD, I'm gonna just talk for just a couple of seconds. Um, during our two-on-two -two meetings, as J.D. said, we had several questions that arose on our revenues, especially regarding the assumptions that we used in calculating the shortfalls. And since Keith already was on the agenda tonight, I held him over, mm -hmm. and I thought it would be a good idea if you guys have some questions. We'd like to kind of walk through our major revenues, what some of the assumptions are on the, on the bigger revenue items, and then kind of highlight Alderman Parker had suggested to change the existing sheet that you, you've been receiving in your packet. And we added an additional row for every one of the revenues, which is our original 2020 budget. And we put it in by month. So as we're tracking revenues coming in throughout the next 12 months, you'll be able to compare what our original budget was compared to what's coming in now with uh, COVID-19. And with that, I'm just going to let um, Keith kind of just walk through a couple of the of the bigger revenue streams and and highlight some of the questions that I know 
um, had already been asked by a couple of council members. So as you can see with this new updated sheet, we added the April actuals in there. And um, when I do these estimates, uh, I use several sources. Uh, if you see the ones that are highlighted, income tax, replacement tax, local use tax, and motor fuel tax, that estimate I rely heavily on Illinois Municipal League to give me those estimates. The last estimate we received from them was before the COVID event in February. And of course, those estimates are out the window now because of COVID-19. So when I uh, originally had tackled this major revenue uh, projections, the first thing I did was we had two scenarios back in the day was whether it's gonna be a two month closure with a quick turnaround or a three month closure with a long drawn out turnaround. And that's what this uh, scenario is that you're seeing today is the three month closure, basically the stay at home order uh, with a very slow turnaround in the economy. Um, as you can see, um, sales tax and home rule sales tax, there is such a lag on that that really for the month of April, uh, if you look at the sales tax for the month of April, uh, the actuals came in at 709000 which is 10% above my original COVID projection. But we knew those were going to be positive because it's a three-month lag. It won't be until June that we'll start seeing um, that. In June will be the actual March sales, and that's where the decline will start to happen. So on this report, the top line is the original budget line, and the bottom is my assumptions down below. Uh, basically, with sales tax, I had estimated uh, basically June, July, August, a big drop, and then um, slowly trickling back up uh, September, October, November, and then hopefully we're at full speed when we get to the month of December. Um, and one of the things that Keith and I visited about today, and I do have to say that I, I, I stand corrected by Keith um, regarding the sales tax, um, the the uh, extended the extended filing requirement only applies to two areas, and I'm going to let Keith kind of talk about that. It is not for sales tax for every entity. No, this was uh, basically to help up the, the businesses that were impacted by COVID-19, and that would be your eating and drinking establishments. Those are the ones that got an extension for reporting periods February, March, and April. And basically, it's extended out uh, beyond four months to. But the good news is, uh, by since we're on a calendar year, by the calendar year, those four installments should be paid in full. So we'll see a cash flow shortage or, you know, but uh, by the end of the year, the revenue in total shouldn't change as dramatic, yep. except for the drop because of COVID. Yep. And during our two on twos, um, we had had discussions that there might actually be a month or maybe even two months where we might not be getting any sales tax in. And actually, that's not going to be the case. It's just going to be reduced for the food and beverage and um, the drinking establishment. So we still will get some cash flow in with our sales tax. And I know another one of the questions that we had was on our motor fuel tax, why our one cent um, per yeah. gallon going into the general fund may not be trending the same as the motor fuel statewide. And I'm gonna let Keith talk, talk about that as well. Well, basically the one cent, you know, is our local imposed home rule um, tax on gas sales. Um, that's um, motor fuel sales, but the state one is is a statewide tax, and then that is distributed to the local municipalities based on a per capita basis. So um, 
what might be happening in Moline with gas sales. And we are on a border, which we all know because it's so easy to go to Iowa, uh, especially when there's a difference in gas prices. But it happens here in Moline, not necessarily it's going to happen statewide, per se. Um, so I just want to, the difference, and basically that's the same with uh, the income tax, state use tax, um, and one other one, um, the replacement tax. Those are all per capita distribution. Keith, yeah, our one. Can I ask yes. a question about the motor fuel tax, Keith? If um, okay. or, or you said that you're using IML numbers, is that what you're doing? I can't remember what organization you. Yeah, we. Re been. I rely on Illinois Municipal League. They okay. usually. Um, they, they should be coming out here in May with new estimates. Usually they do about every three or four months they come out with estimates. So, um, I, I so the just, last okay. go I, ahead. IML just put out a preliminary, and I don't know what MFY stands for, four year, what's the M? Municipal fiscal year. Thank you, municipal fiscal year 2021. Oh, there's this off the year, that explains it. Cause I'm looking at what they've got and they've only got a 15% hit, but it's because their fiscal year doesn't run the same as yeah, that that's makes right. Sense. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, their municipal fiscal year is May 1 through April 30th. And then the course you gotta remember the state, they're on a different uh, fiscal year. They're July 1 through June. So when I take their estimates, I have to tweak it to match it to our, uh, convert it to our calendar year. So Keith, when they're talking about the Illinois Municipal Fiscal Year of 2020, they're talking about what just ended? Yes, that would be uh, May 1, 2019 through April 30th of 2020 year. Oh. So you really want to pick, you want to <laughs> really want to pick up the, um, God. Uh, 2021. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Another item that I know we had had questions on was the use tax as far as online sales go. And I talked with Keith about that as well, and he can give you a little bit of an update on how, how we're feeling that that may be trending now with COVID-19. Well, the trend has always been that we're gonna see a a big increase in use tax versus the traditional sales tax because more people are buying online through Amazon and all the likes like that. And in the Illinois Municipal League uh, publication, they had put out for municipal fiscal year 2020 was the first full year of adoption of the use tax on remote retailers like the Amazons of the world. So next year it's going to be even better they're not only going to collect the state force tax of the 6.25 but they're going to collect the local um, tax that is imposed so that'd be like our um, like our right now we have one and a quarter additional sales tax of the home rule so but overall though my projections, even though we're, we were gonna see a big increase without COVID, but because of COVID and people losing their jobs, I felt like even though there was gonna be a consideration of a drop, um, on that particular one, where is it? I have an estimate of basically almost 15% drop due to the fact that the, um, the impact on people's um, jobs. Yeah, if they don't have the income to support it. But overall, this, this is still showing the $10,491,000 shortfall, which was on our sheet last week. And with that, I thought I'd just kind of open it up. If you have any other questions of Keith, since he's with us. Can I see their faces? Um, yes, Alderman Wind. Uh, a couple of quick things. Um, the sales tax and our home rule, home rule sales tax, uh, I would assume that those will probably run um, 
in tandem. And, and it, it seems that uh, in all months except for uh, September, October, and November, it seems to be like a 75% ratio between them. Um, but but in the, those months of September, October, and November, it's like a 50% ratio for what your projected is uh, for the state. So, for instance, in uh, September, you think that the state's going to do 600,000 and the city is only going to do 300,000. But like the month before, it's 400,000 to 300,000. The month before, 400 to 300. You know, so it's kind of that 75% ratio. Is there any reason why in those three months the, the ratio is different? Uh, the biggest difference, you got to remember on uh, sales tax versus home rule sales tax, home rule sales tax does not apply to vehicle sales. So that's why uh, if you've seen the go back to the history of it, typically uh, a lot of the car dealerships are bailing us out because they are selling cars versus our retail environment is tanking because of the closures of stores and the trends not to go to depart, you know, the brick and mortar stores. Um, so on that one, I just, because that's more of a retail environment of brick and mortar stores, that's why I had a lower estimate for a whole home rule sales tax. But, but it was only in the, those three months, September, October, November, that it was substantially lower. Yeah, because I don't think, in, you know, the problem with the environment right now, there's nothing fixed in stone. We have it. We don't know when the stay-at-home order is ever going to end. And so I think the trend in, in buying, people are going to be more reluctant to go to department stores like they used to do. Not because, you know, the, the younger generation goes online, but because of the, there's not, the vaccine for this COVID-19 is not going to come anytime soon. So I'm thinking the fear in the, in the general public is still going to be to shy away from any large gathering type of, but, you know, if you have a recommendation differently, I mean, that's just my opinion. But uh, we do, I did survey the local um, cities around us to see if I was in the ballpark where they're at. And for the most part, um, we're in the same or close to ballpark with the local cities. Yeah. I'd say we're a little more conservative with our sales tax potentially, but we've got the mall and some of the bigger, bigger box stores as well. So, that are still struggling. Yeah, that are struggling. Do we know how the car dealers are doing? <clears throat> are they selling cars right now? Um, they are selling cars. Usually it's by appointments or online or order online. Um, but the thing with us, we have to wait till the data is in to really get zeroed in on. And so there's a, such a lag on getting the information, but we are you now focusing our attention every month, every time new data comes in to see where we're standing. And that's the beauty of this report is you're going to see month by month, did we trend correctly or did we not? And then at the very bottom of it, we'll have a new um, update of the revised lost revenue. And hopefully, you know, the month of April was a positive um, 8.7 percent increase, so um, that drops the loss down to 10.2. But as you all know, we're in Illinois, and I don't hear any time soon that we're going to be reopening. Yeah, so the governor just came out with like a phased opening, Keith, and I'll forward that document to you so you can kind of look at what the plan is and when we would qualify to open it up. But I think it would be helpful to the council if we understood what the the uh, pie chart looks like for sales tax. I think that we can figure that out because we know who the big sales tax generators are. Or would, would that violate our um, privacy rules 
you know, could we tell the council that, you know, X percent is associated with car sales, Y percent is associated with those big box stores that are still functioning, and then, you know, the other percent is with our small retailers. Is that something we could share, Carol? Um, I think if it's very vague, it's by, yeah, if it's by category, I think we should be able to do that. It's a matter of how timely and updated the information is, but we can certainly try to, to put something together in that regard. I'd be happy to do that. I don't know. Is Are there, there any further questions? Yeah. Go ahead. Maybe it's just more work than it's worth. I'm just I'm just trying to get a sense. I think, yeah, most people are saying it's going to be about this drop and it's going to be into next year, like what you've got projected. But maybe, I don't know. Alderman Potter? Yes. Uh, after having some time to think about a number of these things then, uh, that we've been discussing in the last two weeks and seeing the uh, 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 numbers that Carol's brought forth, um, and discussions just now with regard to the number of uh, people in our community who are uh, um, um, going to be faced with looking for jobs and looking for, um, you know, um, other avenues to to help them through, um, one, and and the and beyond that, the closure of our schools through the end of the school year. Um, I think one of the things that's going to become when we begin to open up that's going to become very important is our library and our library services. There's going to be a number of low-income people who are going to be uh, getting up to the library and wanting to use the internet. Um, there's going to be a, a, a great need for reading materials for school children, um, any adults too. And uh, um, one of the things that struck me was the uh, um, excess reserves from last year's budget, which total somewhere in the neighborhood, I want to say $957,000. And with that in mind, I'd like to make a motion to direct the staff to return $250,000 of the $414,000 uh, that the general fund recaptured back to the library so that the library can function in a, uh, a more robust way when we're able to open back up. We have a motion from Alderman Potter. Second from Alderman Waldron. We have a second from Alderman Waldron. Is there any discussion on this item? All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Nay. 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 I believe we have two aye votes. Is that correct? Alderman Potter and Alderman Waldron? So that motion, Correct. did I miss one? Um, that motion fails. Do you want to um, present the other, I think there's a second spreadsheet. Is that something we want to go over? I can't remember what's on that spreadsheet. Um, there is another revenue sheet, but actually I'm, I'm trying to keep, you were kind of shooting for 730, is that Ooh. correct, Your Honor? Uh-huh. Is there anything? I if I could very quickly, I do have one more handout okay. to go through. And what I can do, I'm going to talk very general, and I'm going to email everyone. You haven't got an email from this yet. And if you can go to the very last handout, Don. Is it the final expenditures? Yeah. But the second attachment that we did not discuss is, is the same revenues, but it shows a 10- and 13-year history. Oh, okay. Thank so we can talk we can talk about that at a later time, but I would like to see the expenditure summary. There you go. And again, this is not, has not been emailed to you. And I will send this out either tonight or I'll, I'll send it out first thing in the morning. As you know, we've been working on putting the summary sheets together to highlight big changes that have been happening across all of our funds. So as the first step, what we've done on this sheet, and I apologize that it's kind of hard to see, we are just reflecting the total reductions offset by increases in expenditures across all of the funds. So you can see kind of the big story. And then by category, we are going to use these big categories to come up with our summary sheet to highlight in big buckets of change what is happening. And I have also been working with Mark Peterson, and I want to get this in a 
in a good order so that when Mark comes in, it is something that he will be able to use as a tool as well when we meet on the 12th. But so just as a brief highlight, I'm going to go to the very bottom of the page. Across all funds, we have actually had expenditure reductions of $9.9 .9 $9 million. And if I can take a couple of minutes, I'll walk through that very briefly with highlights. Those have been offset by increases of, of a little over $4 million in some various categories for net reductions across all funds of about $5.8 million. So Don, if we can go back up to the top, I'm just gonna highlight like five or six categories. And again, you'll be getting a lot of information that this will tie back to. It's gonna tie back to our fund equity statement. And again, the summary sheet um, that I'm gonna distribute hopefully here by the end of the week. If we start out with salary, you can see the top line. We have had, we are currently under a hiring freeze. I believe the total is, it's under 20, but I think it's 18 or nine positions right now we are holding open for a total of $860,000 of a cut um, across all funds in the budget. We've also had some miscellaneous salary adjustments of an additional 602,000. The, the most of that is 414,000 for the library, as you know, that reduction from the general fund is primarily going to salaries. Also, since the beginning of the fiscal year prior to COVID, we also had some retirements that had occurred. And so because we have the difference in, in salaries, um, there's been salary adjustments um, for positions prior to the COVID. We've got overtime reductions of $123,000. And then you'll see some offsets from accumulated sick leave and accumulate other accumulated leave, these were payouts for people that retired recently. Then you'll see in the next category of the benefits, all of the offsetting um, benefits that applied to those positions, either from the hiring freeze or um, for people that have been retired. Down in the professional services category, the net change is about $1.6 million of reductions. And again, across all boards, um, many, many items have occurred in this line item, like our Quad City Visitor and Convention Bureau. We talked about eliminating PERMAR till the end of the year. Um, also in this category is additional expenditures that we have incurred as a result of COVID-19 that has been on the upside, and that includes some of our legal services um, as we work through, as we work through the COVID-19. I'm just gonna skip down here to some other big ones. Um, down into capital projects, you'll see there's been a reduction of the $3 million. This is the variance, the CIP sheet that we worked through here over the last several weeks, and we got the as bids compared to the actual budget dollars. That's where that reflects and some of the differences that have occurred there. And you'll see that we've got the bike, the bike trail and the federal grant. Um, that applies to that. And then the very last category shows all the changes in the transfers, the reduction um, in our transfer to the library for 414. We have a reduction from tourism that was offset um, for planning. And then we've got the additional transfers from vehicle for 750 and facility and from parks that we discussed. So these are big bucket items trying to get the big picture, and then we are using these categories and breaking it. Again, these are net, many things, many things go into these big items, and we're gonna break it down in hopefully a very um, usable format for you as, as we begin to work, um, going into work with Mark. So any questions on that? I'll get this out in a new fund equity statement, and as soon as we get that summary, completed, um, I will forward that to you as well this week. Thank you, Carol. This is much um, easier to digest for me at least, so I appreciate the high level. Does anyone okay. have any questions before she we close out this part of it? Is this the kind of content that you're looking for each week? Um, next week will be a little bit unique because it'll be the work session, but is this the level of discussion that you all want? All right. All right. 
Thank you, Carol. Thank you, JD. Did you have any closing comments? Um, no, uh, Your Honor. I had a couple more things. I um, was hoping to talk to you about an executive session real quick, and then we'll be uh, wrapped up on this topic for the evening. Okay. Thank Thanks. you very much. Um, I'd now like to open it up to public comments. Uh, we do not have any public with us this evening in the council chambers. Can we receive any public, public comment we ahead of time? Not. So we have no public comment. We are going to close out of the committee of the whole meeting and go into the council agenda. Um, we are going to go up to the top. We already did our roll call. I'm assuming we don't have to. Oh, I was gonna, what? I was going to do the pledge. Oh, you're scaring me. Uh, uh, Alderman Schoonmaker, will we have an invocation this evening? No, we'll pass. Thank you. Um, we'll begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mayor, I would like to resume the non-consent agenda reading. Thank you. Resolutions. Council Bill 1049-2020, a resolution authorizing city staff to complete the remainder of phase one of project 1331 and the limited scope of phase two, Florisante Streetscape, 7th Street West of 4th Avenue, by extending the previously approved contract prices from phase one of said project in an amount not to exceed 125,000 and authorizing city staff to proceed with the limited phase two of project 1331. Parker, a motion to approve 1049-2020. Second. We have a motion by Alderman Parker, a second by Alderman Moyer. Is there any discussion? Roll call, please. Alderman Schoonmaker? Aye. Waldron? Aye. Berg? Aye. Williams? Aye. Parker? Aye. Went? Aye. Potter? Aye. Moyer? Aye. Eight ayes, no nays. That motion carries. Council Bill 1057-2020, <clears throat> excuse me, a resolution authorizing the mayor and city clerk to execute and attest to a contract with Walter D. Lott Incorporated for project number 1336, 38th Street Reconstruction, 10th Avenue to 11th Avenue in the amount of $1,119,192.75. Parker, motion to approve 1057-2020. Second. Thank you, Alderman Parker. And we have a second by Alderman Moyer. Is there any discussion on that item? Roll call, please. Alderman Schoonmaker? Aye. Waldron? Aye. Berg? Aye. Williams? Aye. Parker? Aye. Went? Aye. Potter? Nay. Moyer? Aye. Seven ayes, one nay. That motion carries. Council Bill 1058-2020, a resolution authorizing the mayor and city clerk to execute and attest to a contract with Porter Brothers Asphalt and Ceiling Incorporated for project number 1337, 11th Street Reconstruction, 11th Avenue to 12th Avenue in the amount of $447,691.84. Second, third motion to approve 1058-2020. Second. We have a motion by Alderman Parker and a second by Alderman Moyer. Is there any discussion on this item? Roll call, please. Alderman Schoonmaker? Aye. Waldron? Aye. Berg? Aye. Williams? Aye. Parker? Aye. Went? Aye. 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 Nay. Moyer? Aye. Seven ayes, one nay. That motion carries. Council Bill 1059-2020, a resolution authorizing the mayor and city clerk to execute and attest to a funding agreement and single family rehabilitation conditional commitment letter between the city of Moline and Illinois Housing Development Authority, Ida, for the city's participation in the trust fund single family Re rehabilitation program round three with roof only option and disaster contingency award co collectively SFR and acceptance of $416,500 in funding to do all things necessary to execute all assurances and certification to IDA for the SFR, 
and authorizing the Community and Economic Development Department to begin work upon execution of the funding agreement and single family rehabilitation conditional commitment letter to the City of Moline and Ida for the SFR and do all things necessary to implement said program requirements. Parker, motion to approve 1059 2020. Second. We have a motion by Alderman Parker, a second by Alderman Moyer. Is there any discussion? Roll call, please. Alderman Schoomaker? Aye. Waldron? Aye. Berg? Aye. Williams? Aye. Parker? Aye. Wentz? Aye. Potter? Aye. Moyer? Aye. Eight ayes, no nays. Our motion carries. Council 1060-2020, resolution authorizing the Moline Police Department on behalf of the City of Moline to apply to the U.S. Department of Justice for a Coronavirus Emergency Supplemental Funding, CESF, program grant in the amount of $48,027 and authorizing city staff to do any and all things necessary to apply for and implement said grant funding for COVID-19 response and recovery. Parker, motion 1060-2020, motion to approve. Second. We have a motion by Alderman Parker and a second by Alderman Williams. Is there any discussion on this item? Roll call, please. Alderman Schoomaker? Aye. Waldron? Aye. Berg? Aye. Williams? Aye. Parker? Aye. Went? Aye. Potter? Aye. Moyer? Aye. Eight ayes, no nays. That motion carries. And that is all I have this evening, Your Honor. Very nice. Um, and now I'd like to open it up for our miscellaneous council business. We're going to just walk around the room, if you don't mind. I'll, I'll call on each of you, and if you have something, if you'd please share it with the council. Alderman Williams. Alderman Went, uh, Parker. I couldn't remember. Nope. Alderman Parker, do you have anything? I'm either Potter, Went, or whatever. I was yeah, trying to Parker. say if you no. were a winner, but you're not sitting here, so it's hard. Uh, I have nothing. Thank you. Alderman Went has something. I do have something. Um, in light of our uh, recent discussions with staff about the projected uh, $10 million uh, revenue shortfall in 2020 due to uh, COVID-19 pandemic, um, uh, the council wants uh, the residents and business partners of Moline to be assured that the council is dedicated to making the, fisc the uh, fiscally prudent and responsible decisions moving forward so that our residents do not have to bear the burden of the city's financial problems resulting from reduced revenues. So therefore, I make a motion that the council adopt a policy that for the remainder of 2020 and for 2021, that we will not increase property tax rate or sales rate in the city or sales tax rate in the city of Moline, and that we will direct staff to follow this policy as we revise the 2020 uh, and plan for the 2021 budget. Second, Parker. We have a motion by Alderman Went and a second by Alderman Parker. Is there any discussion on this motion? Alderman Went? Yeah, it, it's just, you know, we, we have a, a number of residents who have lost their jobs, who are spending through uh, savings to kind of weather this storm. And I, I want to make sure that they have the assurance that. Uh, we're not going to try to uh, backfill some of this uh, by uh, raising uh, uh, taxes on them uh, in the near future. Any other comments or questions? Discussion? Roll call, please. Alderman Schoomaker? Aye. Waldron? Aye. Berg? Aye. Williams? Aye. Parker? Aye. Went? Aye. Potter? Aye. Moyer? Aye. Eight ayes, no nays. That motion carries. Do you have anything else for us this evening, Alderman Went? Alderman Potter? Nothing, Your Honor. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Alderman Moyer? Nothing. Alderman Schoonmaker? Nothing. Alderman Waldron? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, based on the uh, presentation we've had on COVID, uh, Similar to what Alderman Went just talked about with using your savings, I would like to make a motion that we utilize uh, $1 million out of our reserves to help offset uh, the cuts and the, uh, the work that uh, staff has already done on making these cuts. So I'd, I'd like to make a motion to 
utilize $1 million of our reserve, our 90-day reserve. Uh, as a, also, I'd like to make it so it's the last, last thing we do when we get to the cuts. I'm not sure I'm clear on this. Um, I, I believe he's, the, uh, Alderman Waldron, do you mind if I paraphrase that you are looking yep. to direct staff to use one million of reserves to support the $10 million um, expected revenue shortfall? Thank you. Is that Co correct? Correct. Um, can you clarify something for me? Is this in addition to, I believe if there, we are at like 1.2 million in reserve consumption from facilities and fleet? Is it in addition to that or is it just uh, making a provision of accepting that? It is in, di in addition to that. Thank you for that clarification. Is there a second for that motion? Hearing none, that motion fails for lack of second. Thank you, Alderman Waldron. Did you have anything else this evening? That's all, thank you. Thank you. Alderman Berg. Uh, Mayor and uh, Corporate Counsel, can I rescind uh, number uh, five, which was 1059-2020? Uh, I meant to abstain on that vote rather than uh, saying aye. How would you like to handle that? And I apologize. I thought it at the moment, and then I thought maybe I was wrong. I should have asked you. Sorry, oh, Alderman yes. Berg. Alderman Berg has consistently abstained because of her membership on the Ida board. So let's just make that correction. Right. Got it. Thank you, Alderman Berg, for drawing our attention to that. You had abstained on that previously, so we understand. Did you have Thank anything you, else this evening? Um, nothing else this evening, Alderman no, Berg? Uh, I have a few things that I wanted to share with the council. Um, I, in a call with the governor today, um, he requested that the municipalities advocate with our federal representatives and senators to um, approve uh, funding from the federal level to the states and municipalities to address their revenue shortages. And I wanted the council's feedback. Is that something that you're comfortable with me drafting a letter on behalf of our city um, to our federal representatives? Or would you like to have some discussion on that? Would you like to review the letter? I, I'm not <coughs> sure about the timing, if it would be fine to wait till next week. I just don't have a sense of that. But that request was made. I've got, I've got some thumbs up. It would be my preference to proceed and um, represent the city in that letter. <coughs> OK. Um, so I'll, I'll work on that with Janine's help. And uh, the next item, I wanted to update you all on the TIF SSA drama that we were exposed to. Um, if you all recall the update of the recalculation or the new calculation that was coming out by the county that was going to result in significant tax increase to the tune of multi-million dollars to our downtown area. Um, uh, Dirk worked very closely with the state's um, state attorney. Uh, I, I can't remember Villarreal um, Dora. Neiman. Dora. Yeah, Dora, um, and she was she really uh, gave us a solid on that one and um, has compelled the county and they are going to calculate those taxes as they had calculated them in the past. So those tax bills will come out in an unaltered state. So that's very good news for our downtown businesses um, mm. and I'm appreciative for all the work that went into that to make that adjustment and then I have one more item and that is uh, there has been an advocacy or I don't um, I don't know how to describe it JD has had a formal meeting I've had multiple conversations with the chamber um, they are doing some um, Mm, structural adjustments and they came to us earlier this week with a proposal to disband Quad City First and um, take the revenues that we had previously um, committed to Quad City First and bring them into their general operating for the chamber. Um, it's uh, the initial meeting with the administrators. There were lots and lots of questions. I had lots of questions on that. Um, but I wanted to get a sense from the council about what kind of feedback um, you feel. They were going to they were intending to proceed with a Quad City First vote this Thursday. I believe that has been delayed, but I don't have any reason to control that. So I believe that's been delayed for now. It gives us a little bit more time, but I wanted to bring it up to the council as we work on our expenditures this year 
and our budgeting plans for next year. I believe that our funding rate is something around 70000 but I'm just doing that off the top of it's, my head. Um, I can tell you exactly, Your Honor. JD's um, going to tell us exactly. I so I, I, I guess um, what I want to talk to you about is um, the way that we fund that. We would fund it for 2020 in late summer. Do we want to proceed with that since this is kind of in the works? Uh, because probably the formal decision of whether or not that we consumed would come after our 2020 payment, or do we? What's the JD's got the number? Uh, it's fifty-eight thousand eight hundred and forty-five dollars. Thank you. Uh, and so, just looking for some conversation about that, Alderman Went. Yeah, I, I've got uh, a little bit of concern. I, I'm not really sure exactly how this is going to funnel through. What the return on investment is going to be. Uh, I, I know that there had been some comments that um, uh, Quad City First hasn't been spending all of their money uh, that we've been putting into it year after year, and there's been some, I think, uh, funds funneling back and forth already between um, uh, the Chamber and uh, Quad City First. So I, I've got some real reservations, and unless we really understand how this is going to be uh, utilized, I mean, we're making cuts throughout our uh, our budget, including our library and parks and, and different things. And this seems um, a, a really good time to relook at this $58,000 uh, and uh, um, and make a determination if that's the appropriate amount to, to send over, uh, if it's gonna be just kinda swept into the general fund at the, uh, the chamber or uh, what would be the best use for those funds right now. And just to clarify some direction, and I, I don't mean to cut anybody else off if they have something to say, but I think it would be a reasonable thing to do right now to direct staff to hold that if an invoice comes in until we better understand what the game plan is there instead of it just rolling out without us um, making sure that it's going to be spent the way that we intended it to be spent when we budgeted for it. Alderman Potter. Is, is this our entire uh, obligation to... Uh, the chamber, or is this just a Quad City First part? That's that's Quad City First. That's our that's our only engagement with the chamber. We're not like members. Yeah, it, they don't view us as members even with that obligation. So if you uh, like, if you attend one of their events, we pay as non-members when we attend that event. Does that make sense to you? Yes. Um, I know times are difficult, and and I, I just I'm, I am concerned, obviously, about more how how they're restructuring and how they're going to move forward. I'm sure this is a difficult uh, operating environment for just about anybody right now. I would agree. Does any do we want to give um, staff some direction on this? For. Your Honor. Oh, sorry, Alderman uh, Schoonmaker or Alderman Went? I'm not sure who was. Right. Alderman Went. Yeah, I, I, I uh, don't have any problem with uh, us uh, making a motion to direct staff to hold uh, payment on that until we get uh, some some more answers of exactly what's what's going on with that with uh, this transition. Second. Alderman Waldron, second. <laughs> Sorry, you're, Alderman you're Waldron. Way. You have to come in if you want to get the second. Alderman Williams <laughs> snuck in there in his whisper second. So we have a motion from Alderman Went and a second. She died over. Was that? Oh, I thought I heard someone talk. Um, okay, so we've got a motion from Alderman Went and a second from Alderman Williams. Is there any further discussion on this? A roll call, please. Alderman Schoonmaker. He's muted. Sorry, I was muted. So an I vote is to withhold, correct? Yes. Yeah, is to hold back the money. Yeah. So I. Walton? I. Bird? I. Williams? I. Parker? I. Went? I. Potter? Nay. Moyer? I. Seven ayes, one nay. That motion carries. And then I have one more update, and that is on our virtual state of the city. And so um, Janine, before the meeting, uh, forwarded an invitation to me, so you all be getting another invitation. But that 
virtual State of the City will be um, able to be viewed at noon on Monday, next Monday. Um, and it'll be available on, is it YouTube, city website, It'll and be, the public all television? The, all the, uh, all of our social media and whatnot will go on, and then whatever time you want to get scheduled for on the Econ channel will go on as well. So I think it's scheduled at noon. Yeah. I think David set that up. Um, so there'll be different ways for you to watch that, but it's coming together. Um, we are working with D Films, and they're doing a fantastic job of integrating everybody um, and getting mm -hmm. the message out to the community. So hopefully you'll be pleased with the, the product for our first ever virtual, and hopefully our last. Um, that's all I have. How about staff? Do you have anything for us today, J.D.? I uh, just wanted everybody uh, to know I'll be off. I'm going to take some vacation time in the morning. I'll be here after lunch. Fantastic. So. Thank you. Anybody else? Chiefs? Nothing? Um, do we have any public comment this evening? Hearing none, Alderman Byrd? Uh, Your Honor, I make a motion that the council convene an executive session for the purpose of discussion of pending, probable, or imminent litigation 5 ILCS 120-2C11, collective negotiation Negotiating Matters 5 ILCS 120-2C2, and Appointment Employment Compensation Discipline Performance or Dismissal of Specific Employees 5 ILCS 120-2C1. Second. We have a motion by Alderman Berg, and I'm sorry I didn't catch the second. Who is the second? Alderman Parker, second. Thank you. Uh, roll call. Alderman Schoomaker? Aye. Waldron? Aye. Berg? Aye. Williams? Aye. Parker? Aye. Went? Aye. Potter? Aye. Moyer? Aye. Eight ayes, no nays. That motion carries. Um, if you'd please clear the council chambers and the virtual meeting if you are not a participant in our executive session. We'll give you a few minutes.